Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch, and today we've got one for the Rust Stations among us. Yes, we are looking at a Rust game engine, or I guess well, more accurately, we are revisiting a Rust game engine. Today we are looking at Bevy. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, you're probably a subscriber. I covered this back in August. If that sounds interesting to you and you're not a subscriber, click that subscribe button. We cover all kinds of game development news and topics here all the time. So anyways, I covered this one back in August, and i got to clarify something I said. When I did this video, I said... This is my fave yet. Now, when I said that, what I meant is my favorite Rust game engine or framework, not my favorite framework or, or game engine overall. I suppose I should have been clearer when I said that. And to be honest, to stay, this day, that stays true. As far as all of the Rust stuff I've been exposed to, uh, Bevy is kind of a sweet spot between being uh, interesting and well-archetyped, but not being overwhelming. A lot of the uh, things I discover in Rustland are very over-engineered. Bevy didn't do that, but it is a slick, well-designed framework. So we're going to be taking a look at it today. Now, one of the reasons why we're looking at it today is because the 0.5 release was just done. We'll get to the details of that in a second. But first, let's cover some of what Bevy is all about. Now, you see here, it is available at bevyengine.org. So if you want to check this out, that'll be there. Of course, I will link this in the linked article down below like I always do. Now, the big thing about Bevy is it is data-driven and ECS. Now, those are two buzzwords that are just getting hit at game developer after game developer after game developer because that is the new hotness. And there's reasons for that. We're moving into a world where we've got we're getting faster processors that are being fastened by the means of parallelization. So if you can break your game up into data and then systems, which is what an ECS is all about. Simple, simple top level, not going into a 10 minute definition of ECS. Basically what you've got is entities, which are uh, instances of stuff in your world. They say they're not a collection of components, but nine times out of 10, an entity is a collection of components. A component is the data of your game, uh, say like your player's position, the texture attached to it and so on. And then systems are the things that do stuff with the components. When you break things up this way, it's nice because you can have your systems independent, your components independent, and then a lot of the processing is literally just looping through those things, doing things as fast as possible. Now, you might think your game engine is component-based, and that's probably true. Almost every game engine out there in way, shape, or form is component-based. You've got uh, Unreal and Unity with its old mono behavior. Um, let's see, uh, Godot, sort of, it's node-based, but it's still components, basically. Um, CryEngine, Lumberyard, all of those, they all use a component-based system, but an entity component system, that separation of action from components uh, it is, is a little bit more rare. And that's one of the core things about Bevy. So that's all I'm going to get into on the whole ECS thing. Just do know uh, ECS is a big part of Bevy as is being data-driven. Just keep in mind that is also an area that has changed greatly in 0.5. Now, other features of Bevy include 2D rendering, 3D rendering, a rendering graph, which allows you to abstract away the rendering pipeline from the underlying uh, game graphics. So you see, not tied to a specific graphics API. That means you can have OpenGL, DirectX, or whatever on the back end. And you, as the programmer just work with these render graphs for setting up your rendering pipeline. Uh, in terms of platforms, you've got Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Also, Android, iOS, and web are on the way. Now, do keep in mind, this is a 0.5 release, so you're not super mature at this point in time. It's, it's a stable one, for sure. You could use it to develop games right now, but if you want something that is done and fully sweet, you're going to probably want to go with a production game engine with all the tooling and so on. This one is an in-development framework. Uh, so we got a UI system on top, also ECS driven. Uh, you have a scene system for loading, instancing, and hot reloading. This is where your game data is stored. Uh, you got the ability to load MP3 files as assets and play audio using out audio output resources. You've got hot reloading, so if you make a change, you can do it without having to recompile and restart your game. Uh, fast compile times, Bevy, you can expect a 0.8 to 3 seconds with fast compile configurations. Uh, so definitely quick and it's also free and open source. We'll get to the source code in just a second. So that is the gist of it. Nice thing is there are a decent number of resources out there for learning Bevy. So if you want to go with it, it is a well-documented project. Now, the reason why we we're talking about it today specifically is because Bevy 0.5 was released and there's quite a bit here and I'm going to skim it because a lot of this is really implementation specific and really getting into the weeds here. I will of course link this, but let's do a quick summary of what is in the 0.5 release. 
Nice thing is there is a migration guide. So if you're currently using 0.4, there's instructions on moving forward. Uh, they've got uh, PBR or physically based rendering. That's pretty much the standard rendering system, you know, where you're building things out of metallic roughness, uh, diffuse emissive maps and so on. Um, it now uses PBR shaders when rendering. Uh, GLTF improvements, they've got improvements to the way they work and the way they are loaded. So you can now have top level GLTF assets, uh, which makes it easier to go ahead and load it. So you can see the process of loading uh, an asset from GLTF is a heck of a lot easier now. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, Bevy is really core to being ECS. Well, what they did is created a brand new ECS layer on the back end. Uh, they used to use um, Hex. Now they've got their own in-house. Uh, so there's all kinds of things that they've done there. A full rewrite of the ECS core, massive improved performance, hybrid component storage, archetype graph for faster archetype changes, stateful queries that cache results across run, uh, supports for explicit system ordering, system labels, system sets, and improvements in run criteria, increased system parallelism. Again, that is one of the big things about ECS is that you can parallelize your data and your execution on that data. And that is generally the way that computer hardware works these days. So if you want to get a performance gain out of a computer, this is the whole reason why Unity is pushing towards that whole data oriented technology stack and ECS there. It's faster generally than the old way of doing things. So uh, they have improved their speed there. Uh, rewrite of the state system. State is basically just persistent data between now and before. Um, a more natural stack based state machine, direct integration with the new scheduler and improved state lifecycle events. So that means when things happen like on load, on, on delete, on so on, we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details of all those changes. Everything they just talked about is summarized here. Now what they've done is they've changed the way component storage is done. They've kind of got it so you've got two options of how to do things. You could use tables, uh, which have the advantage of being faster to iterate through, but slower to add or remove from, or you can use sparse sets. Then this is an implementation detail. And if you don't give a darn, I believe tables are it by default. So this is one of those things you can kind of ignore. But if you've got an edge case where you've got uh, a lot of adding and removing from your uh, data set, then you're probably better off working with sparse sets, but those are slower to iterate over. So when you know you run through all of your components, it's going to be a little bit slower. So you have two options and you can choose which one you want to use like so. Pretty simple. Um, and they got some performance improvements across the board between the two. So either way, either implementation with their new ECS system, you can see by this graph, lower is better. Tables are going to be... I thought tables were faster. I'm not sure what they're measuring here, but you can see here uh, a fairly significant speed change, regardless to which way you go. If you go with sparse, you go with tables. It's just one will fit one scenario better, the other will fit the other. And the nice thing is you have a choice. So basically this is an implementation detail of how all of the data is stored within the ECS of uh, Bevy. So uh, again, we're getting really into the into the weeds here. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, when you're dealing with ECS, a lot of what you're doing on, in the end is you're basically creating lists that you want to iterate through and do stuff on really fast. And that's what makes it fast. And part of that is you're going to be doing for each is you're going to run through everything in a list of components or a list of systems and doing something. And so they've optimized there for each query iterators to make it even faster. Another big part about using ECS is doing things at the same time. And that's where the, where the, where the, where the, where the, where the, where the parallel system executor kicks in here. So uh, they've got some improved or rewrite areas in this area with a new executor. Uh, systems run in parallel by default. Systems with explicit ordering defined will respect those ordering. So if you want something to happen before something else, you can define that. Otherwise, by default, things will run in parallel. And then we got a lot of new features in terms of parallelizing uh, your code here. So explicit dependencies and system labels, many to many system labels, system sets, improved run criteria, ambiguity detection and resolution. So you're getting some really in the weed stuff here, but definitely important changes. Uh, reliable change detection, this is important. So if something changed, if you wanna handle when something specifically happened or this item is changed, uh, that is in place now too. Uh, states v2 is in here. So a new system of how state is implemented. This is for doing things like on, well, as you can see here, on enter, on update, on exit, um, I don't know why they have on enter twice. Oh, two things in game and menu. So if you want to handle particular events, states has been updated, it's persistence between you know before and now. Uh, that functionality is in place here. We've got improvements to the way that events work, makes it easier to work with. So they're now first class shorthand for working with events. 
Um, and we got some other improvements. I'm going to run through these really quick because there's a ton of stuff here. So we got rich text. You got ability to do uh, each with their own. So text can now have sections, each with their own uh, style and formatting. So you see here, you've got different color on this different set of text right here. Uh, we got high DPI text support. Nice for people like myself with 4K monitors. You can now render text into a 2D world space. You got a world to screen coordinate conversions. You've got an orthographic camera with with camera scaling modes, uh, flexible camera bindings. You got render layers, uh, sprite flipping, uh, color space is now in a new, enables uh, lossless and correct color representation. You've got a plugin, wireframe plugin for doing wireframes over your 3D objects. You have a new 3D example, Alien Cake Addict. You got improvements to the timer system. You got improver to the asset management system. The WGPU configuration options, scene instance entity iteration, window resize constraints, a uh, number of other changes to the ECS version too. So big thing here was definitely the rewrite of the underlying systems, the ECS and uh, you know, various different pieces we saw there. And that is the gist of the 0.5 release in terms of what is coming next for Bevy. Uh, pipeline rendering and render optimizations, the Bevy UI redesigned animation components, uh, component animation and 3D skeletal animations. That'd be nice to see. Entity component systems for relationship indexing, async systems, archetype invariance, stageless system schedules. So more control over how your ECS is working. 3D lighting featuring uh, shadows, more light types, and more bevy scene features and usability improvements. So that is that also a uh, big thing that you're going to be looking at is when the bevy UI comes in. This is when we start going from being a framework to a game engine because there's going to be a bevy editor, you know, something that competes with the likes of Unity, Godot, Unreal, and so on. And that is going to be after the UI design is finished, which obviously makes sense because they will be building the editor on top of their UI. So there is no real like top level tool per se in the official Bevy as of yet. It's one of those things to be aware of. All right, so that is the 0.5 release of Bevy. There is quite a bit there. A lot of it, again, is plumbing related stuff, but definitely nice to see. Uh, if you are interested in checking out Bevy, it is open source on GitHub. It is under the MIT source license. It is constantly updated. There's a pretty good team of 209 contributors working on this particular project. So it's definitely a popular one. As you can see, 98.8% of the code is using the Rust programming language. And yeah, so that's Bevy. It is a refreshingly simple data-driven game engine built in Rust. Although technically I would argue it's a framework, at least as of yet, but give it time. It will be a full-blown engine. Uh, and then if you're interested in learning more, you saw earlier there is the Bevy book you can use to learning it. Uh, there's also a number of examples out there, a number of tutorials to get you going. Um, and then we got a number of different libraries and plugins, etc., available out there. Um, so if you want to extend upon Bevy, there is a number of options available for you too. So I will link this. So if you want to jump in and start looking at some other uh, code and so on, uh, this is an option out there. So if you want to see how to work with Bevy, Awesome Bevy is a pretty good place to start. Also, if we go back to the very, very, very beginning, um, I think it was the very beginning. Yeah, there's also the Bevy book, which will walk you through what you need to know to learn to use Bevy. Now do realize, again, this is a 0.5 release, not a 1.0 release. So a lot of the things they just did are going to have broken a 0.4 releases code. And uh, this is, you know, really core stuff. They're, they're nailing down the fundamentals, the basic stuff. So each one of these releases, you should expect if you use Bevy for your commercial title, when 0.6 goes, you're going to have to do an update. The nice thing is they do do those migration guides so you can figure out how to. Just be aware, until it gets a little bit more stable, you're going to have breaking changes every time there is an update. But as you saw from this particular release, there is quite a bit in there. So that's nice to see. So that is Bevy, a Rust game engine slash framework. Let me know what you think. Comments down below, and I will talk to you all later. Goodbye.